Hello, my name's Chris Oates from Newcastle University and the Alan Turing Institute. And today I'm going to tell you a little about our new paper, Probabilistic Models for Integration Error in Assessment of Functional Cardiac Models. This was joint work with Steve Niederer, Angela Lee, Francoise Avribriel and Mark Girolami. So the long-term goal of this research was to understand and predict the response of individual patients to treatment for diseases such as arrhythmia. These diseases are emergent features of a complex dynamical system whose regulation occurs on electrical, chemical and physiological levels. As such, these processes require intensive simulation to properly understand. Here in the video you can see one such model in action. Just this short simulation alone cost hundreds of CPU hours to obtain. Now, in statistical terms, the computational model is governed by a number of patient-specific parameters, theta, that are unknown in general. The forward uncertainty quantification problem involves taking a probability distribution, p, over these parameters, representing our current state of knowledge, and pushing this uncertainty forward through the computational cardiac model, denoted f. The push forward can be used to reason about the response of a patient to a particular treatment. In particular, we use this output to compare the predictive performance of different cardiac models to decide which model is best. However, the cost of f and p poses a fundamental barrier to obtaining this output, and as a result makes it difficult to compare models. Indeed, take two integrals, i1 and i2, representing predictions based on two different models, f1 and f2. To determine which model's prediction is best, in principle, we need to accurately compute each integral. Since this is impossible for complex cardiac models, we instead take a statistical approach where i1 and i2 are treated as random variables. In particular, we are in the situation where both f and p are unknown, and this requires some methodological work. To start, let's recap Bayesian quadrature, where a Gaussian process prior is placed on the integrand f. This is conditioned on a number n of function evaluations, limited by our computational budget. The posterior distribution over f has a convenient closed form, as does the posterior marginal over the integral. By the way, this idea dates back at least to Mike Larkin in 1972. Let's take a closer look at the posterior mean, mu n, for the integral. It depends on p, which is unfortunate for us, as p is unknown. So let's treat p as something to be inferred. There is also a way to do this, but Dirichlet processed mixture models turn out to be natural. Here p is modeled as an infinite mixture of psi densities, and the unknown mixing distribution, capital P, is assigned a Dirichlet process prior. The values theta j are modeled as iid draws from p. The posterior then has a particularly nice characterization as a linear combination of psi densities. The wj and phi j can be sampled via a construction called stick breaking. Now, going back to Bayesian quadrature, let's replace p with this characterization. Commuting the sum and the integral, we see that Bayesian quadrature can proceed provided that the boxed integral has a nice closed form. Fortunately, this is the case for several pairs k naught and psi, which is why I said Dirichlet process mixture models were natural. Let's put all that together to get our proposed method, Dirichlet process mixture Bayesian quadrature. Oh, and if you would like to see theory for posterior contraction, that's in the paper. The rate is necessarily slower than standard Bayesian quadrature because p must also be learned. Right, that's the method. Let's see it in action. For intuition, consider the classic extreme value example used to break standard Monte Carlo confidence intervals. For a reasonable choice of the prior, our 50% credible intervals are conservative at small n, with coverage probability greater than 50%, while standard Monte Carlo confidence intervals are obviously going to be overconfident. The same behavior is seen to a lesser extent with the computational cardiac model. Here we really want to avoid overconfidence, else we might claim that a bad cardiac model is better than a good cardiac model. Given the huge amount of time and effort that goes into building and running these models, comparative assessment is a crucial stage in the development towards models that provide both accurate predictions and improved understanding of cardiac function. There are still statistical challenges to address, but overall we are excited that these methods we have developed could play an important role in accelerating progress towards the clinical translation of computational cardiac models. Thank you for watching this video summary. If you'd like to find out more, please visit the links below for the paper.